saved while the children are getting settled. I'd like for us to turn in our Parsha today, Katitsa, when you take, and it comes from Shemot or Exodus chapter 30. Shemot or Exodus chapter 30. This is a pretty powerful Parsha today. You really probably should take notes. Pay close attention to every word that God is going to speak to us today. Wasn't last week awesome? Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. We actually didn't get to go through the to the whole parsh of last week, but God had a He 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 intervened. Amen. Amen. When we intervene, we have to go the way He chooses for us to go, and we saw the outcome of that. Let's give him a hand clap of praise for all those souls that came to him last week and all those who really dedicated their lives. Amen? I want to pray again. Abba Father, we bless you and we praise you and we thank you for this Shabbat. Father, may your will be done this day in all of our lives. Father, we ask you right now, if some of us, if some of our ears are a little dull from here, open our ears this day, Father. Open our spiritual ears to hear what you're going to speak to each one of us individually through your word today, Father. That it can change our lives, Father, in every way. Change our lives spiritually to be drawn closer to you emotionally, physically if we're dealing with some kind of sickness or problem for you are the healer. And Father, financially, if Father, we've been struggling in our finances, help us to hear clearly what you're speaking to us today. Father, I pray that no man would be seen today, but we'd only see you. We'd only see your word spoken through Yeshua the Messiah, and we give you praise and honor and thanksgiving now for that. Ahead of time, we thank you for what you're going to show us. In Yeshua's name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Again, I'd like to say thanks to all our visitors. We trust that you will be blessed today. Thank you so much. Hallelujah. Let's see what kind of pictures she's got me up here today. It's the same ones. Same one, that's good. <laughs> Just briefly, I know that you are at the Parsha. Today, and that, and that starts at uh, 30 and 11. Just want to back up just shortly. You know, last week, and I trust everyone read this because we didn't go through all of it. You know, the consecration of the priest, the sacrifices, the food for the priest, the altar of incense. Isn't it interesting? The altar of incense kind of like showed up out of, out of order, it seems like. But see, God has a, a plan for all the way all this is done. So all these things were shown in uh, last week. Uh, and today we're going to get into uh, chapter 30. And we're going to begin with verse 11. yod the Lord also spoke to Moshe, saying, When you take a census of the sons of Israel to number them, then each one of them shall give a ransom for himself to yod the Lord when you number them, that there be no plague among them when you number them. See, God has an order. He's not, he's not too much on numbering. And he has a way it has to be done so it doesn't cause problems. And so he's saying that, you know, when you take this census, when you number them, this is what everyone who is numbered shall give. He, that, there has to be a ransom in this numbering. Half a shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary. The shekel is 20 gerars. Half a shekel is a contribution to Yodei Vafei the Lord. Everybody remember when Reuben Prager was here and he's, he's the one that's been responsible for in our modern times recreating the half shekel for the temple. Everybody remember that? Everyone who is numbered from 20 years old, this is where it starts, from 20 years old and over shall give the contribution to Yodei Vafei the Lord. The rich shall not pay more and the poor shall not pay less than a half shekel. God so ordained it as a half shekel so that anyone could afford to be able to give that half shekel. Let's read it again. The rich shall not pay more, and the poor shall not pay less than a half shekel. When you give the contribution to Yod Evafe the Lord to make atonement for yourselves, and you shall take the atonement money from the sons of Israel, and shall give it for the service of the tent of meeting known as the Mishkan, the tabernacle in the wilderness, that it may be a memorial for the sons of Israel before yod to make an atonement for themselves or for yourselves. And yod the Lord spoke to Moshe, saying, You shall also make a laver of bronze 
with its base of bronze for washing, and you shall put it between the tent of meeting and the altar, and you shall put water in it. So let's, let's look at that. Where's that labor? Right there. See there? There's the altar. See the altar? And you come through the gate there, through the veil there, the first thing you see is the altar. So the sacrifices are made. The next thing is the labor between there and going in through the veil into the holy place. And so once the sacrifices were made, the priests were to wash themselves in the labor. In other words, they were mikvah themselves. They were, we want to use a modern term to help people understand. You could say they were baptized, being baptized to a degree. I, it's really not, but I want us to understand that they were being cleansed, being purified, washing themselves after the sacrifices. So the first thing is the sacrifice. First thing is, we're to, Yeshua gave himself as a sacrifice, what, to redeem us? And we accept that sacrifice when we come to him by faith. And what are we supposed to do, do then? We're supposed to be mikvah, right? We're supposed to be washed. Well, hallelujah. See, the, see how the picture is going? Okay. So you, you shall put water in it. Let's read that again. You shall also make that labor of bronze with its base of bronze for washing. And you shall put it between the tent of meeting and the altar. And you shall put water in it. And Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet from it. When they enter the tent of meeting, they shall wash with water that they may not die. What's the deal here? They got to wash in that before they enter into that tent of meeting. If they disobey God, they're going to die. That's what it's saying. God has a way that you came. We come before Him. He has a way today that we come before Him. The only way we can come before Him is through the blood of Messiah. The only way we can come into the holy place is through the blood of Messiah. So, verse 20 again, when they enter the tent of meeting, they shall wash with water that they may not die. Or when they approach the altar to minister by offering up in smoke a fire sacrifice to Yodavapi the Lord. So they shall wash their hands and their feet that they may not die. And it shall be a perpetual statute for them, for Aaron and his descendants throughout their generations. Moreover, Yodavapi the Lord spoke to Moshe, saying, Take also for yourself the finest of spices, a flowing myrrh, 500 shekels, and a fragrant cinnamon half as much, 250, and a fragrant cane, 250, and a cassia, 500, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, and of olive oil, a hen. And you shall make of these a holy anointing oil, a perfume mixture, the work of a perfumer. It shall be a holy, the word is kadosh in Hebrew, and a better English terminology than holy would be a set-apart, a special set-apart anointing oil. Because it was only to be used for this purpose only. It's set apart unto God. We as a priest to today, when we come to Messiah and he redeems us, we're set apart unto him. He's bought us with, with, his, with a price, his own shed blood. We no longer belong to ourselves. We are to be set apart unto him. And I want us to see these pictures today, how that, because a lot of us haven't really fully understood this and the impact of it. How that we are saying, when I accept that atoning blood, it's a free gift. None of us can buy it. None of us can purchase it. He paid the price to provide it. But we're to count the cost if we're going to accept that to follow him. It's a free gift, only through his atoning blood, through what he's done. So, he, is, he makes us cup to those. He makes us holy. It says, And you shall make of these a holy anointing oil, a perfume mixture, the work of a perfumer. It shall be a holy anointing oil. And with it you shall anoint the tent of meeting and the ark of the testimony. So even that's anointed. And the table and all its utensils and the lampstand and its utensils and the altar of incense. Even all these, everything in there is being anointed with this special anointing oil. And the altar of burnt offerings and all its utensils and the labor and its stand. You shall also consecrate them that they may be most holy, most set apart, most kadosh. Whatever touches them shall be holy, kadosh, set apart. When he puts the oil, the Ruach HaKadosh, the anointing oil in us through the Spirit of God, we're to be set apart unto him. Empowered by his Spirit, to live for him in his glory and honor. And you shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them, that they may minister as priests to me. And you shall speak to the sons of Israel, saying, This shall be a holy anointing oil to me throughout your generations. It shall not be poured on anyone's body, 
nor shall you make any like it in the same proportions. Remember he talked about the incense and how that it couldn't be, you know, it couldn't be made exactly. It is holy and it shall be holy to you. Whoever shall mix any like it or whoever puts any of it on a layman shall be cut off from his people. Then Yodi Vav, hey, the Lord said to Moshe, take for yourself spices. Stakit and Anka and Galbanum, spices and with pure frankincense, there shall be an equal part of each. And with it you shall make incense, a perfume, the work of a perfumer, salted, pure, and holy. And you shall beat some of it very fine and put part of it before the testimony in the tent of meeting. Where I shall meet with you, it shall be most holy to you, most set apart to you. And the incense which you shall make, you shall make in the same proportions for yourselves. It shall be holy. Kadosh set apart to you for Yodevate the Lord. Whoever shall make any like it to use as a perfume shall be cut off from his people. God's saying this is specific to how we worship him, how we come before him, and no one else is to, to do this. No one else. He had a way that the priests were to enter into the holy place. And today, he still has a way. Only one way through the blood of Messiah that we're to enter into the holy place. Chapter 31. Now, Yodei Bavhe, the Lord, spoke to Moshe, saying, See, I have called by name Baziel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. Now, this is important. Remember that this man that he's called is of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the spirit of God of Elohim, what in wisdom, in understanding, and in knowledge, and in all kinds of craftsmanship. What's important here is the fact that all three of these to, are together. Because the scripture tells us that knowledge, and I'm paraphrasing this by itself, knowledge puffeth up. If we don't have God's if we have, and there's a lot of people, man, gets into knowledge today. We got knowledge going on everywhere. We got people just getting all this knowledge in the Messianic community, and some of them's getting this knowledge, and 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 man, they they'll just fight you over this knowledge that they're right and you're wrong in your knowledge, you know, because they're missing they're missing the other part of uh, of God's spirit Amen. and wisdom and understanding. Amen. You know. God's knowledge, His truth, was never meant to work by itself. It was to work by the eternal spirit. The Bible says that the letter killeth the knowledge of God, the word of God, killeth. Why does it kill? Because none of us can keep it. We're going to fall short in some way or another. And that's why it's a death sentence to us. Does that make it bad? No. God's word is true. But the spirit, the spirit giveth life. The spirit of God in us with the knowledge of the Torah, the mitzvot, the commandments of God, been put in our hearts and minds, empowers us and enables us to keep it through the blood of Messiah. You can't have one without the other. When you got one without the other, you're going to get shipwrecked. You're going to have problems and difficulties. You're never going to understand what's going on. So, this man was in God's divine order to do this task because he had the spirit of Elohim, of God in wisdom, in understanding, and in knowledge and in all kinds of craftsmanship. So he also had the physical ability in craftsmanship. Amen? God's given each one of us different gifts that we have in our life to work to make a living and to do things in the kingdom. To make artistic designs for work in, a, in gold, silver, and in bronze, and in the cutting of stones for settings, and in the carving of wood, that he may work in all kinds of craftsmanship. And behold, I make, excuse me, and behold, I myself have appointed with him Aholab, the son of Ahishmach, of the tribe of Dan. And in the hearts of all who are skillful, I have put skill, that they may make all that I have commanded you. The tent of meeting or the Mishkan, the tabernacle, or all three, it means the same thing. And the ark of the testimony and the mercy seat upon it, and all the furniture of the tent, for the table also and its utensils and the pure gold lampstand with all its utensils and the altar of incense. Remember, God has an order of how this is going to be done. He's doing it from the inside out. You see, so many people today tries to do it from the outside and go in. 
If God don't get your heart first, there's no amount that you can do on the outside. No matter how many nice dresses, ladies, you get, and how much wonderful jewelry and makeup, or men, a nice suit and all that. None of that. You might look good on the outside, but you can be like dead men's bones on the inside if God doesn't have your heart first. It's better to be wearing what you got, your rags, so to speak, on the outside, and him to have your heart first, and then he can take care of the rest of it. It's always a heart issue. God needs to have our heart first, the circumcision of the heart first. Amen. And he works from the inside out. See, when he gets our heart, when he gets our heart, he'll get our finances. When he gets our heart, he'll get the way we talk and the way we act and the way we treat one another. When he gets our heart and he shows us his Sabbath, we'll give up all the festivals and all the, all the uh, pagan festivals we've been taught and we'll keep his festivals. When he gets our heart, see, he'll start changing us little by little. We'll be like an onion. My wife and I, when God began to deal with us many years ago, we, we kind of felt like an onion, how that when he got a hold of our heart and opened our eyes, he began to take one layer off. You know how an onion has a lot of layers on it? Amen. He began to take one layer off at a time, and then he'd reveal something in the next layer to us that needed to come off. You know, because if, if he took everything off at one time, we couldn't survive it. We would die. We wouldn't be able to deal with it. He deals with us right where we're at. He knows where each one of us are at. He deals differently with me. He may deal differently with you than he deals with me. You see, that's why we can't judge. We've got to give it to God and let him deal with us individually and accept one another where we're at in the kingdom Amen. while he's working all these things out in us. Let's go to verse 9 again. The altar burnt offering also with all its utensils and the labor in its stand, the woven garments as well, and the holy garments... Uh, for Aaron, the priest, and the garments of his sons with which to carry their priesthood. Now look at this. Isn't this interesting? Because what is this? The garments. They're like the last thing, aren't they? Huh? The outward? What you're going to see on the outside of the priest? They're like, the, they're like almost the last thing. See? The anointing oil also and the fragrant incense for the holy place they are to make them according to all that I have commanded you. What did he command Moses? To do it exactly like the pattern he had shown him on the mountain. Now, all this has been done. All this has been set in order. God set all this in order. And now guess what he's going to talk about? He's going to talk about a sign of a particular thing, the Sabbath. You really want to pay close attention to this and take notes. And Yodei Vav, hey, the Lord spoke to Moshe, saying, but as for you, speak to B'nai Israel, or the sons of Israel, saying, You shall surely observe my Sabbath. He didn't say, You might observe my Sabbath. He didn't say, he didn't say If you feel like it, you can observe my Sabbath. Now these words in legalese in the law today is very important. He said, you shall surely. That means there's no questioning about it. you got to do it. If you're in covenant with me, this is a requirement I have from you for one of my commandments. Specifically, of the Big Ten, we call it number four. You shall surely observe. What does it mean to observe? It means a lot of things. It means to guard, to keep, to do. So it's not just an abstract Rico roman thing of I'm keeping it in my head. I'm doing it in the spirit. <laughs> Floating around. You know, if you're doing it in the spirit, that means somehow you have separated your spirit from your body because you're only doing it in the spirit. Do you get my point here? No, you're going to do it in spirit. The Bible says, and here's the key to that, you, shall, you must worship me in spirit and in truth. Now let's talk about what that means for just a moment before we continue on. What is truth? The Hebrew word is emet. God's word is his truth. It is the body of the law. It is the written word. It is the body. This is the body that you're seeing. The spirit that's in me is God's spirit that's in me. If he removes the spirit that's in me out, I'm dead. Went to a funeral yesterday. Knew the young man. Thought the world of him. Died with a heart attack real young. When I look at him, though, and, and, and know for all y'all's ever been, when you look at someone after they died and they're laying in that casket, you don't, you don't, you can tell that the spirit's gone. I'm telling you, you can tell it's gone. That's just the body laying there. Amen. You see, so 
when, when Adam and Habal were in the garden and, and, and Satan beguiled them, the snake, the serpent beguiled them, and they disobeyed God, and that day they surely died, God had to come back and he had to do a sacrifice to redeem them. So he's saying this, but as for you, speak to the sons of Israel, saying, you shall surely obey my Sabbath. So the truth, he met the body. Keeping the Sabbath is not something you can just do in the Spirit. You can't just say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go shopping today because the Sabbath and I'm resting. I'm going to stay at home all day today and just want to lay in the bed and rest. Am I saying you should never rest, lay in bed? Well, there are circumstances when we need to. But just stick with me a minute, okay? My way of resting on the Sabbath is going to the movie. My way of resting on the Sabbath is playing golf or going boat riding. And I'm going to share this with you in a little bit, okay? Because I want us to make a point that God's Sabbath is His Sabbath. Amen. And we're going to enter into it the way He wants us to enter into it. Haven't we just gone through that this, the God that we serve, the Creator of the universe, is exact? He puts everything in exact order, and it's perfect when He finishes up. So, He met truth. You must worship me not just in according to the letter of the law, because if we just worship him in truth, so to speak, without the Spirit, we're trying to worship him according to the letter of the law. We're trying to be justified by keeping his Torah. We're never going to make it. That's right. We're going to fall short. Amen. We can't make it that. We cannot be justified through keeping the letter of the law, the truth of God, because we need some, a helper, and that's the real condition, the Holy Spirit, that he puts in us, that empowers us, to be able to walk out the truth of God, to learn the truth of God and to walk it out. And then he has that mercy and grace here with us as we're learning, amen, when we fall short. So you shall surely, I know I'm saying a lot to talk about this, but I want us to get the picture clearly about how important this Sabbath is because after he, after he put all these things in order, the Mishkan, the tabernacle, the priesthood, and how it was to be held, the first thing that he wanted to deal with with B'nai Israel with the children of Israel was the Sabbath. Uh-oh. The first thing. The very thing that he created in Genesis, and of all the days, there's only one that he gave a specific name to. The rest of them were numbered one through six. Yes, the seventh was numbered seven too, but it was also a specific day, a set-apart day, a holy day, a day of the Shabbat, the rest, in him. And we're going to talk more about what it means to rest on that day because a lot of people struggle over that. I know I struggled over it, but we're going to learn some things today. Okay, let's get back to 13 again because we haven't got past it yet. Y'all keep stopping me. <laughs> but as for you, speak to the sons of Israel, saying, You shall surely observe, keep, treasure my Sabbaths, plural. Sabbaths. Why is it plural? Because there's seven high Sabbaths called feast days. Uh, also, that goes along seven times a year with the weekly Sabbath, which today is the weekly Sabbath. It's done every week. For this is a sign, a sign. The Hebrew word is Strong's 226, oath. And it means a sense of appearing, a signal, a flag, a beacon, a monument, a mark. Did you know that God's got a mark on us on our forehead, in our hand? And did you know the anthem aside? The false Messiah is also going to require a mark, a number of his name in the people who disobey God in the end of days because he counterfeits everything that God does. He counterfeits it all to deceive you and to get you away from the creator of the universe and to do things his way. So this is a sign or a mark between me and you. Between who? Me and you. Who's me and you? God and us. Amen. Everybody who's in covenant relationship with him. Jew and Gentile alike. Everyone who's been grafted into the olive tree. Everyone that belongs to the house of Israel. doesn't matter if you've been calling yourself the church or not. If you're truly in covenant with him and you just didn't know the difference what all those terminologies mean, God's going to be he's revealing all these things to us in these last days. But it doesn't matter if you're covenant with him. It's about you and him. Me and you. You and him. Me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am Yodei Vate who sanctifies you throughout your generations, that you, I'm going to say it, I, may know that He is Yodi Bapi, the Lord who sanctifies us. Who sanctifies us on a daily basis? He does by His eternal Spirit, through the washing of the water of His Word, 
Therefore you are to observe to keep the Sabbath, for it is holy to you. It is kadosh. It is set apart to you, body of Messiah, bride of Messiah, army of God. It is set apart to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. For whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. You say, Rabbi Wayne, you mean if y'all we come here and, and we profane it, y'all gonna put us to death? No, I'm not gonna put you to death. Ain't that's not our job. That's between you and God. He said he, he's going to put you to death. Amen. If you disobey him and you don't repent and get things right. What did he tell Adam and Havah? He said, listen, you can do anything you want to in this garden. You can eat from any tree you want to in this garden except for one tree. In the day that you eat from that tree, you shall surely die. Now, when they ate from that tree on that day, did they die? They did and they didn't, right? They died spiritually immediately. They were separated from God, but their, their flesh, their body, was become corrupted, didn't die for almost, I think I only lived about 900 some years. But they, but guess what? Even in the natural, they still died the first day because God makes it clear that the day is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day in God's understanding. So even then they died. Even though they lived in our way of counting, our way of thinking, 900 some years, they spiritually died at that moment. And the only thing that could get them spiritually back alive was God making a sacrifice, okay? Separated from God. So when we disobey God willingly, and we know that, you see, here's the thing of it. For a lot of people, see, keep, let, me, let me make this crystal clear. Keeping the Sabbath will not redeem you. It will not save you. Otherwise, it's by the works of the law. So I want to make sure that you don't leave here and get this wrong, what I'm trying to share with you. If you come to faith through Messiah, and you may have never been taught this. You may have never really under because you've always thought for a lot of Christian believers that Sunday's God's Sabbath that was changed to Sunday. God never changed it. Man's changed it. Amen. That's traditions of men. That's right. And so are you saying that we can't worship on Sunday? No, we can worship every day of the week. Amen. We should worship Him every time we get a chance. Amen. But you've got to understand this. Once you come to the clear understanding of when He requires us to come before Him on a set-apart holy day, and you clearly know it from the Word of God, then you become responsible to do it His way. Amen. Okay, so you so when you understand that, and, and because I'm going to tell you something, when you understand it, there are so many blessings in it, your life will be changed forever. It will never be the same. You will be wanting, you'll be looking for Friday evening to come mm -hmm. to Saturday evening. You can't wait for that 24-hour period of time when you can cut golfing out off, when you can cut all the things that the flesh desires off, and you can get in communion with Him, when you can get together with your family, which is not done too often in America anymore, except there are exceptions to the rule, and you get around the table as a family together, and you have a meal together, and, and you have your holler bread, whatever food you fix together, and you're just praising God, and you're waiting on Him, and you're reading and studying together as a family unit, God will change your life, and He will draw your family closer together Amen. than it's ever been before. And the enemy of your soul does not want you to know that. So He devised other ways, other Sabbaths, to pull you away from that and let you think that you're still serving God <laughs> and doing things... Well, I'm being really, I'm, 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 I'm going to church. I'm going to synagogue. You can go to synagogue. You can go to Sabbath. You can keep Sabbath on, on the outward, but not on the inward, and still not be keeping that Sabbath. Did you know that? Amen. Because why? Sabbath begins with the heart first. You know, you may get it finally in your heart, and you may be working a job or something that requires you to work on the Sabbath day, God's Sabbath, His seventh day. And now you don't want to do it no more. Because when you really get it in your heart, you're not going to want to do it anymore. That's when you're going to know you've got it in your heart. Yep. Now you've got a problem, don't you? So I've had people come and say, well, I, well, should I just go tell them, look, I, I can't work on Sabbath. And I said, no, no, don't do it yourself. Fire. God knows that you didn't know this. He knows that you, you've been doing it the other way for a long time. You've got to use wisdom. You need to start praying and ask God to work this out for you. Yeah. Maybe you need to go pray, and maybe he'll tell you to go talk to your employer about, hey, you know, uh, I would really, you know, like to have Saturday off, but I work on Sunday. Because most people want to take Sunday off, see, in the culture we live in, because they think that's God's Sabbath. Okay, you see what I'm saying? You've got to ask God to help you. He'll change this for you in time, if you really desire for it to be changed. So don't go getting crazy, okay? 
Wait on God, pray, and let Him work this out with you. Amen. And He will. Verse 14. Verse 15, I should say. For six days, work may be done. That's what he's saying. Work may be done. In other words, anything you want to do, work, whatever you want to do. Six days, golf, play, boat, work, whatever you want to do. But on the seventh day, there is a Sabbath of complete rest. Complete rest. Means the whole 24 hours, the whole day. Holy dosh. Set apart to who? Yodavav, hey, the Lord. Not set apart to you and I, set apart to Him. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall be surely be put to death. So the sons of Israel... Now let me say this, under the law of Moses, out in the wilderness, you know, if you got caught and you had two or three witnesses purposely violate the Sabbath, they did stone you. They did put you to death. Messiah's come, you know, in mercy and grace. And, and, you know, we're in a land, the Bible also tells us to obey the laws of the land. So, you know, if you go out and you stone somebody, well, the Bible told me it all, that I could stone this person because I caught them working on the Sabbath day. Well, you're going to jail. And I'm going to tell you, and not only you going to jail, but if you're in a state where they execute people for murder, you're going to be executed. That's not what God's saying. God deals with that, okay? That's right. Amen. For, the sons of, for the sons of Israel shall observe the Sabbath, to celebrate the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. Perpetual means forever. It is a sign between me and B'nai Israel. Sons of Israel means every person who is in covenant with the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Every man, every woman, every boy and every girl. Okay, all the families. It is a sign. Let me let me tell you about the sign. This is what I believe. Okay? I can't pull a scripture out and tell you it says it specifically. But we know it's a mark, it's a sign, it's it's in our forehead, it's in our heart. But the reality too is it's like the wedding band. When you get married so you got married to God through Messiah when you accept, accepted the blood sacrifice. You became the bride of Messiah. And the Sabbath literally is the wedding band. It's the sign that you're in covenant with Him. Did you know that? It's like a wedding band, a sign. It is a sign between me and the sons of Israel temporarily for 2,000 years till Messiah comes. No, forever. Forever. For in six days you have the Lord and made the heaven and the earth, but on the seventh day, which day? The first day, day, the first day of the week? Nope. Second day of the week? Nope. Seventh day. Does this agree with Genesis? Absolutely. It's still the Sabbath, it's still the seventh day. And I'm going to show you something because, well, someone says to me, well, yes, Rabbi Wayne, but you know, uh, when God talks about these commandments in the New Covenant, the Brit Hadashah, the, or the New Testament, whatever term that you may use, uh, it's nowhere to be found that he uh, required us to keep the Sabbath. Well, I'm going to show you that it is there in a moment, okay? Some of you already know this, but some may not know this. So you want to look at your Bible when I show you this, because you don't need just to believe it because I'm telling you. You need to see it for yourself in God's Word, okay? So before we do that, though, I want to do this. I want us to turn to Isaiah 58 real quick, because I said I was going to share a little bit about this Sabbath, okay? This is what the prophet says about it. <clears throat> Isaiah 58. Now, the prophets always agreed with the Torah. And they brought even more light and understanding to the Torah for the house of Israel. I want us to understand clearly here today, too, that this is for the house of Israel. This is for those who say that they're in covenant with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is not required of the unbeliever, okay? Don't you go out there and try to put some kind of religious understanding on an unbeliever. Your only job to the unbeliever is to love them, and when the door opens and God opens the door by the Holy Spirit, is by loving and share the good news that Messiah died for your sins and you can be a part of the house of Israel. Then it becomes for them. Okay, this is for us. All these, all these things, most of the time, is God is dealing with us because we're stiff-necked and hard-headed. Uh-huh. You, me and you. That's right. That's the way we are. So God has to constantly remind us, okay? So over here, the prophets are reiterating because, why, what, why did he send these prophets out? Because Israel had gotten away from God, away from his Torah, his instructions, for the house of Israel. Every time they did that, he sent one of his prophets on the scene to the northern kingdom or the southern kingdom when it was divided. 
Okay, so it says in verse 13, If because of the Sabbath you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure on my holy day, what? Our own pleasure. We walk away, in other words, from doing our own pleasure on his day. And call the Sabbath a delight. And when you get it in your heart, it will be a delight. I promise you. The holy day, the Kadosh day, the set apart day of Yodei Vav, the Lord, honorable. And shall honor it, desisting from your own ways. Your own ways. It's not about us on this day. From seeking your own pleasure. Listen to this. Seeking your own pleasure. Well, I just feel like that I'm resting when I'm playing golf. That's your own pleasure. You let the enemy deceive you. God didn't tell you to go play golf. Or You know, you can play golf. You've got six other days of the week to play golf. That's what you like to do. If you're claiming to be in covenant with God, then you need to desist from your own ways. And speak in your own word. It, look, you know, I've had to stop people before they come visit. Sometimes I do it now. And sometimes we may need to remind each other we get sidetracked on things when we're back there at Oneg or something. And for you know, we're talking about something that we do during the week or something. This is not about what we do during the week. This is about God's Word on His Sabbath. We're supposed to be sharing with each other about Him and His goodness to us. You understand what I'm saying? We're not even supposed to be speaking our own Word. We're supposed to be speaking His Word. Well, right by the way, you're kind of orthodox, aren't you? Well, if obeying God to the best of my ability is being orthodox, then I'm orthodox. Hallelujah. I've been accused of that time or two. You know, the way I look at that is then, to me, if that's a blessing. I hope that I get more orthodox for the glory of God, not for my own self, but for, for His ways. We need to all be strictly orthodox for His own ways. But we understand now, with meekness, with humility, and love, okay? Not the... Not, not the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law. Yeah. Okay? Verse 14. If you do all this, then you will take delight in your day of the Lord, and He will make you ride on the heights of the earth, and will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father. For the mouth of your day of the Lord has spoken. Do you really want to ride hard? Do you want to be on top and not on the bottom? Do you want to be the head and not the tail? Obey God. Keep His Sabbath. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 All right. Now, let's do one other thing. This Because this is from the prophets. Remember, we like to share this from what? The Torah. The instructions that God gave to the house of Israel. We like to share the same thing. What the prophets had to say about it when they got out of line. And now we want to see what was said about it in the Ruth Hot Child, the New Covenant. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 4. Now, I know we're spending a lot of time on this day because if we don't get this point first, this point is the this is the sign of the bride of Messiah. This is the wedding band in our relationship. And from here, God teaches us all the rest of it. So you can share this with people who are questioning you and take them to these scriptures and show them not your opinion, but what God has to say about it. Because our opinion is not important. It really isn't. My opinion is not important. It's what God has to say about it. That's all that really matters in the end. That's all that's going to matter when we stand before the judgment throne. Okay, Hebrews chapter 4. I'm going to start at verse 4. For he has thus said somewhere concerning the Sabbath or the seventh day. We're in Hebrews now. New covenant. Seventh day. It's specific to the seventh day, okay? And God, Elohim, rested on the seventh day from all his works. So he's verifying in the Brit Hadashah, the new covenant. He's verifying the same word in Genesis and in Isaiah, what the prophet had to say about it. They're all in agreement with one another. Verse 5, and again in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. Who's they? Those people out in the wilderness at Mount Sinai where we're at today who was disobeying him. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it. Some enter it. Who's those that enter it? Those who believe. And those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience. Now listen to this. This is interesting. There's several things in this that's very interesting. Number one is, who is they who formerly had good news preached to them? It was those people that we're talking about today in the Torah, the house of Israel, out in the wilderness, under Moses, 
That's who it's talking about. And guess what it says about them? They had the gospel, the good news preached to them. The same thing was preached to them that's preached to us that we preach today. Oh, I thought that was a new thing. Oh, no. No, God's word's always been the same. Yeah. It was ministered to them just like it's ministered to us today and we minister to others. So it says, and those who formerly had the gospel, good news preached to them, failed to enter because of what? What? Disobedience. They rejected keeping the Sabbath. But Rabbi Wayne, you know, it's the death sentence over here, out here in the wilderness with Moses, if they don't keep the Sabbath. And we know we saw where they, a man was caught gathering wood and uh, uh, two or three witnesses, and they got with Moses on it, and he was willfully doing it, and he was stoned to death. Remember that story in the, in the Torah? Well, what about, all them, you know, what about all those people? A lot of the people kept it because they were afraid of being stoned. And that's the only reason they was keeping it, physically. They made sure they didn't work because they didn't want them rocks to be hitting them on the body. Okay, but inwardly in their heart, they were not keeping it. That's what I said earlier today. You can keep it on outward, but if you ain't keeping it on inward, you might as well not be keeping it on outward. Unless, of course, you know you're going to be stoned, then you might want to kind of like figure out how to keep that from happening. Right? So it's a hard issue first. You can keep it inwardly, you see, and they didn't. It says, he again fixes a certain day in verse 7, today, saying through David after so long a time, just as has been said before, today, if you hear his voice, and his word is his voice, his word is met, it is truth. Today, and you hear, it by the, you hear it by reading it, and the Holy Spirit agrees with it in your heart. Do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. Now here's where it gets very interesting. There remains therefore a Sabbath rest for the people of God. New Testament. Book of Hebrews clearly defines, agrees with the prophet, agrees with the Torah, that there still remains a Sabbath rest. It didn't say for the world. It didn't even say for religious people who really aren't in covenant relationship because see you can be in all kinds there's all kinds of religion out here but they don't have a born again experience they had not truly had a heart experience where they, they have been atoned for by the blood of Messiah they're just being religious so if that is truly the case and we're not and we can't judge that and we can look and see you know if there's any fruit on a tree sometime but that's not for us to judge is that then it's not for them it's for the people of God the Jews and the Gentiles who have accepted that atoning blood, who have come into covenant relationship with the Messiah, there is still a Sabbath rest on the seventh day for the people of God that he requires. And this is what he says in verse 10. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. So you can't just put it out there in the spirit. You've got to stop doing your work too on that day. It's spiritual and it's it's, it's spiritual and it's physical. And then he says this. Let us, you and I who are in covenant with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through the Jewish Messiah, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall through following the same example of disobedience of those people out there in the wilderness with Moses. It's crystal clear. Now you have the evidence in the Word of God. You need to let the Spirit of God deal with you if you're struggling with this. And you've got also information to share with people. If, if God's already convicted you in your heart and you haven't fully understood it, I trust today that you're starting to understand it better. If you have any questions at the end of the day, we're all done. I'll be glad to talk to you about it. All right, let's go back to where we were at. I knew this was going to take a lot of time today. Hey, this is a powerful message today. Amen. We barely got started, and it's 3 o'clock. But it's his Sabbath, right? If it's his Sabbath, we're okay, aren't we? Are we here for him? Amen. And you hear what he wants to say to us today? Amen. We fall in love with him and his Sabbath like that. Well, you know what? We won't even worry about the food in the back, back room back there because, you know, our mind will be on the, that, that living bread and that living water that he's putting in our spirits. Amen. Okay? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. Verse 18, And when he had finished speaking with him upon Mount Sinai, he gave Moshe the two tablets of the testimony. 
Tablets of stone written by the finger of God. On those tablets front and back, on those two pieces of stone, the finger of God himself wrote those letters, those ten words on those tablets. Moses didn't do it. I want the young people to look up here and pay attention and quit looking around at each other. Okay? Right now. Thank you. Now, when the people saw that Moshe delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled about Aaron and said to him, Come, make us a God who will go before him, before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Moses is up there for the people, hearing God's voice. They had already agreed that they was going to keep God's commandments before they even knew what was in them. Moses is up doing a job and people are already getting restless. They don't know what's happened to him. They're getting restless. And now they're wanting Aaron to make him a God. <clears throat> Come, make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And Aaron said, and let me say something right here. Moses has been delayed in the presence of God to get the word of God for the house of Israel. And I remember in the Brihasha, in a prayer board, it says the master, they said the master's delayed his coming. We've got to be careful not to let the enemy make us think because Yeshua hasn't returned yet that the master's delayed his coming. He has a specific time. It's our job to be a bride that's ready at all times about the Father's business, about the kingdom's business. Amen. Okay? And Aaron said to them in verse 2, Tear off the gold rings which are in your, in your ears and your uh, wives and your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. Now, let's, let's just take a quick view of this. All, these, all this jewelry they had on. When they went before Mount Sinai with Moses, remember how they came? They came dressed up nice. They had the gold earrings and all that and all. They came before the king dressed up nice. Well, now... Here's a parallel of that. They're wanting him to make a God because they don't know where Moses is at. And now he's wanting them to take those very things that they agreed and showed up dressed up nice before the creator of the universe to use them to make a false God. That they already agreed they wouldn't do it. Remember? Okay. Then all the people <laughs> tore off the gold rings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he took this from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a molten calf. And they said, this is your God. Who said? that Those people who were wanting him to do it, who had taught him to do it. He knew better. Aaron was Moses' son, uh, brother. He shouldn't have done that. He's went up being the high priest. You know, and there's always the perplexing question why God didn't kill him too. But it said, and they said, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Wow. Already, for more, Moses even gets down from the mountain. They then went back, and you know, one of the biggest gods in Egypt was, was, was the calf god, the, 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 the bull god. And so they've made this god. It says, now when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, now listen, this is what he said. This is extremely important because we need to understand this. Tomorrow shall be a feast to Yod He attributed this feast tomorrow to the name of the creator of the universe with an idol. Well, we wouldn't do that, Rabbi Wayne. We wouldn't do that today. We do it all the time. We attribute Pesach, which is coming up, Passover, which is a memorial of Yeshua coming the first time to betroth himself to his bride. We attribute, instead of keeping Passover as a whole in America, I can speak for America, I can't speak for the rest of the world, we usually put Easter <coughs> in the place, which is the God Ishtar. We choose a counterfeit, Satan chooses a counterfeit. A counterfeit God, counterfeit resurrection. That's insane. We're, and people would, People would tell you plainly, and, and you know what? They really mean it. You know how I know that? Because I used to, before I knew what God's Word clearly said, and I got convicted in my heart. Because I just believed what I was told. I didn't take a personal relationship 
serious enough. I had one, but it wasn't serious enough for God to read his whole word because I was told to focus only on the New Testament. And you can't even understand the New Testament without the foundation Amen. of the Old Testament and the prophets. That's what helps you to understand it. Easter, the fall feast, instead of obeying the and proclaiming the fall feast when Messiah is going to return, our rehearsal the second time for his bride that he's been betrothed to in the spring feast. We do Halloween. We have all kinds of other things we do depending on what, what, uh, what, how we've been raised, Christmas time and all these things. You know, and it's not just that. Some of the things we put in places are uh, as idols. This is talking about idolatry in place of his ways. Our homes, our, our houses become more important. Well, you know, I really want to be there tomorrow, but I really need to do some work in my yard. After all, you know, I just can really rest on the Sabbath when I'm working in my yard. You don't believe people? I, listen, I've used all kinds of excuses before I knew. But see, so do we have any calves? Do we have any golden calves in our lives today? It's for us today, God's speaking to us today and saying, let's do an inventory today. You know, we're fixing to start unleavened bread before long. You know, it's time for you really to start using your leaven up so you don't have to, you know, waste money and stuff to get it out of your house. But the whole point of unleavened bread is what? To see, is there any remnant of sin? Any remnant of golden calf worship? Any remnants of things still in my life that's keeping me from being as close to the Messiah as I can be. If you're really in love with him, it's like a husband loving a wife and a wife loves, loving a husband. When you're in really lo in love, why well, are you just looking in them eyes and you just can't, oh, oh man, I just, you just want to be around each other all the time. Don't you? Oh yeah. I see some smiles back there. Uh-huh, I see, I, see, I see some of that going on right now. That's awesome. Hallelujah. So we need to check during this time today. Do we have any remnants of any golden calves left in our lives? Let's get them out. Amen. Amen. Let's repent of them and move on for, for the glory of God. Tomorrow, Aaron, the one who's going to be the high priest, the brother Moses says, tomorrow shall be a feast to Yodi oh, How sad. So the next day, they did what? They arose early and offered burnt offerings. They also arose early when they was going to go before Mount Sinai and agree to the covenant and brought peace offerings. And the people, then they sat down. This is taught in, in 1 Corinthians, they don't know if we get to it or not, in our high shy readings, talks about food and idol worship and all that. This is what this is talking about. Sacrificing to idols. Because this golden calf, they were not sacrificing to you know, Vatha, even though they said they were. They were not. They had set up a false idol, a false god. They sat down to eat after they did the sacrifices and offerings and to drink and rose up to play while they had a party. You can do it the right way or you can do it the wrong way. You can do it God's way or you can do it Satan the world's way. But you know, the sad thing here is this. This was the house of Israel. This was the people of God who had already agreed to the covenant, and they're breaking it. They're breaking it. Then Yodei Vapai, the Lord, spoke to Moshe, Go down at once, for your people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Now I love how this goes. You know Moses had a special relationship with the creator of the universe. When, I, when they started acting like this, God said, Moses, these are your people. Now you need to get down there and straighten them out. <laughs> when, when they ain't doing right, it's Moses' people, you know. So they have quickly turned aside from the way. What, what way? Yeshua said, I'm the way. I'm the truth and I'm life. What way? God's way. God's commandments. That he had already decreed to them, declared to them on Mount Sinai. And I just want to remind us, you know, in all religions today, all is usually based on one individual usually that had a vision. And he began to write it down and share it. And they formed this different Mohammed. Islam come from Mohammed's <coughs> visions. You get my point? Buddha and all these guys. So it's always from one person, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God on Mount Sinai didn't just speak to one person. He spoke to Moses. Moses obeyed him. 
But they, the whole nation heard him speak the ten words to them. God spoke to the whole... It's the only, only, if you want to use the term religion, that God spoke to a whole nation that's recorded. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They have made for themselves a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. He's telling Moses what they've done. Uh, it started, I know I'm cool up here and I see people wrapping up. Somebody needs to turn that down so I know y'all are cold. You're not. Well, you're the only one. Y'all, uh, raise your hand if you're real cold right now. Well, try to, try to modify it halfway. <laughs> Verse 9, In Yodi Bafe the Lord said to Moshe, I have seen his people, and behold, they are an obstinate people. Stiff-necked people. That's us. That's how we are a lot of times. We need God to speak to us every day. Amen. Now then, let me alone, that my anger may burn against them, and that I may destroy them, and I will make you a great nation. What's, what's Elohim saying to Moses? I'm just going to destroy every last one of them. I'm going to wipe them clean out off the map. And I'm going to take you, Moses, and I'm going to start with you, and I'm going to let you start, and I'll, through your seed, we'll raise up a whole new nation. That's what God said to Moses. That's how serious it was. The Moshe, or Moses, entreated Yodeh Vapeh, the Lord God, and said, O oh, Yodeh Vapeh, Adonai, why doth thine anger burn against thy people? So he says, now Moses articulating back to him because he's in that great relationship with him. Thy people. It's not my people. It's your people whom thou hast brought out up from the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. Why should the Egyptians speak, saying, with evil intent, he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and destroy them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy burning anger and change thy mind about doing harm to thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou didst swear by thyself, and didst say to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heavens, and all this land of which I have spoken, I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. He's reminding him. He's reminding God because he's in that special relationship with him, you know, as an intercessor. So Yodeh Bafe, the Lord changed his mind about the harm which he said he would do to his people. Moshe is entered into this more of an intercessor realm for the people of Israel. If it hadn't have been for Moses, which is a picture and type of Messiah Yeshua to come, who is our what? High priest and intercessor today for us before the throne of God in a, in a true tabernacle in heaven when we fall short. That's my daughter. They're, they're praying they fell, fell short and they're, they're asking forgiveness for their sins. My blood's covering him. He's interceding for us all the time. All the time. Let's read 14 again. So Yodeh Vavhe, the Lord, changed his mind about the harm which he said he would do to his people. Then Moshe turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand. Tablets which were written on both sides. They were written on one side and the other. And the tablets were God's, Elohim's work, and the writings was Elohim's writing engraved on the tablets. Now when Joshua heard the sound of the people as they shouted, he said to Moshe, there is a sound of war in the camp. Remember, Joshua was up at a certain place waiting for Moses. But he said, It is not the sound of the cry of triumph, nor is it the sound of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing I hear. And it came about as soon as Moses came near the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger burned, and he threw the tablets from his hands and shattered them at the foot of the mountain. This again is another proof right here that the covenant they had, they had already agreed to, that he went up to get in writing on the tablets of stone by the hand of God, that covenant because of this, this is how serious this golden calf incident really, really was. The covenant was broken. And by him throwing the tablets down and shattering them, it shows again that the covenant had now been broken. The covenant's been broken. And let's read on. And he took the calf with which they had made and burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it all over the surface of the water and made the sons of Israel drink it. And there's a teaching in the Torah in another place. We don't have time to go into it today. But about the unfaithful bride, you know, and, and how that certain things was done and, and, and certain things, the dust was picked up and all, and she was made to drink. And if she had, and, and she was lying, and she had been unfaithful, her, her, she would swell up. It would, in other words, the sin would show up. I'm paraphrasing this quickly, okay? 
This is what's happening here. Moses is actually applying this to unfaithful Israel here, to the bride of Messiah here. Let's watch what's happened, okay? So he scattered it over the surface of the water and made the sons of Israel drink it. And the sons of Israel means all those who were involved in this, women and men alike. Then Moshe said to Aaron, what did this people do to you that you have brought such great sin upon them? Now he's getting on his brother. Brother, how could you go along with this? You know? And Aaron said, do not let the anger of my Lord burn. You know the people yourself that they are prone to evil. He wants to justify it. He wants to justify what he did. The reality of it is, if we're God's servant, even if they stone us, we cannot go along with it. We cannot go along with what we know is wrong and what is sin. For they said to me, make a God for us who will go before us. For this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And that's true. And I said to them, whoever has any gold, let them tear it off. So they gave it to me, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I think he got a little carried away with some of the other Egyptian stuff that was going on by those false uh, Egyptians back there. I just threw this gold into the fire, Moses. He's trying to convince his brother this calf just jumped out of there. Now we know he fashioned it, molded it, and made it. Now when Moses saw that the people were out of control, for Aaron had let them get out of control to be a derision among their enemies. So it's clear here, Aaron did not really do what he was supposed to do. He didn't have to let them get out of control. He could have put the hammer down and, made, and, and said, we're, you need to stop right now. You're not going to do this. Then Moshe stood in the gate of the camp and said, whoever is for Yodi Vav, the Lord, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered together to him. And he said to them, Thus says Yodavah, the Lord, the God, the Elohim of Israel, every man of you put his sword on his thigh and go back and forth from gate to gate in the camp and kill every man and his brother and every man and his friend and every man and his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did as Moses instructed, and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. Now this is interesting here because there's a lot of things that are really not said here and we have to understand other parts of the scripture to figure out well seems to me like there's a lot more than 3,000 yeah there were probably several million people were there okay but so but only 3,000 with the in the camp and, and the Levi's killed 3,000 well how was that determined how about when they drank the water the ones who were guilty it showed up there was a sign upon them that they were the ones to be executed. That's what you understand from the Torah when you read the whole Torah, see? Amen. That's how he knew. Okay? And I'm just going to share this because we'll probably run out of time. 3,000 souls died. 3,000. The interesting thing is, is all this giving of the Torah, back in Torah, the giving of the Torah, took place on Shavuot. Okay? Now, Shavuot or Pentecost, and during the time of Messiah, when he came and he died and he rose again and sent to the Father, and he told him to go and tarry in Jerusalem until the promise of the Father came. On that day, how many souls, after Kepha, Peter, all those Messianic Jews, you understand what I'm saying? How do I know they're Messianic Jews? Because they're followers of Yeshua the Messiah. And guess what? There was a whole lot of non-Messianic Jews there from the nations who could afford to come to Shavuot, who had the money to come from the surrounding nations, which we consider part of the lost tribes of Israel, maybe. Yeah, that's right. Maybe. You know, people argue about that, but that's, we won't make a point out of this. They were there for Shavuot because it was required for the males to come up. The temple was still standing three times a year, and that was one of the times. And they were not believers, and they were out in the diaspora. Okay? And they were there, and what happened was the power of God fell like it did at Mount Sinai. The Spirit of God was given them because Yeshua had died and rose again, and it was available to whosoever would believe. Amen. Not just a few of them, like He gave His Spirit and put it in Moses and put it in the 70 elders and things. It was now available to everybody. Amen. And so they spoke, and it says, they heard, oh, they spoke in other tongues. But guess what? Those other tongues were the different languages that these Jewish people who knew Hebrew too understood from the places, the nations where they had been. The one, and they were perplexed at this. Why are these just Galileans from up in the area? They don't know all our languages and stuff, and yet we're hearing the wonderful words of God being spoken to us. And it says that day that 3,000 souls were born into the kingdom. Amen. One day, 
3,000 souls. You see why? What's, what's the difference here? Over here, the letter killeth. It was the letter of the law, the Word of God they violated, and it was a death sentence, and they died. Over here, there's the letter of the law, but the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the law, too, here. And 3,000 souls, who should have already had a death sentence, they've given life. Okay, and they're brought into the new covenant. The covenant is renewed. And if we have time left today, we'll get into that, okay? So, so let's go on from here. I know y'all need a break. Can we get to the bottom of this and we'll take a short break, okay? All right, my hand slipped. Where was that? 29. Thank you. 29. Then Moshe said, Dedicate yourselves to Yodi Vafe, for every man has been against his son and against his brother in order that he may bestow a blessing upon you today. Sound like a blessing to you? Sure it is, because he's, he's going to deliver them from, from what the enemy's trying to do to destroy them. And it came about on the next day that Moses said to the people, You yourselves have committed a great sin. <coughs> And now I am going up to Yodei Vafhe. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Then Moshe returned to Yodei Vafhe, the Lord, and said, Alas, this people has committed a great sin, and they have made a god of gold for themselves. But now, if thou wilt, forgive their sin. And if not, please blot me out from thy book, which thou hast written. Moses is saying, If you're not going to forgive them, Abba Father, I want you to even blot my name out. Man, he, was, he loved the people. As bad as they were, he loved his people. But we know there's only one person who can write that name in there and one person who can blot that out. And so he said, In Yodi the Lord said to Moshe, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. Revelation 3 and 15 says this, He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will profess his name before my Father and his angels in heaven. Glory to God. You know how you overcome through the blood of Messiah. Yeah. And his eternal spirit in you empowers you. And he won't, you know, your name, how's your name getting there? Through the blood of the side, the entering the covenant relationship. And if it wasn't possible for it to be blotted out because you turned your back on God and never returned to him through repentance, he wouldn't have said that to begin with. But now, but go now, lead the people where I told you. Behold, my angels shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I punish, I will punish them for their sin. God doesn't always punish people immediately. Sometimes he punishes them later on. Then Yodei Vafhe smote the people. Then Yodei Vafhe smote the people because of what they did with the calf which Aaron had made. Now there's a lot of things that we can get from this. The 3,000, I've already shared some things. It could be too that 3,000 that when, when they drank from the water and, and it showed up on perhaps a lot of these involved leadership. I don't know. You know, leadership are accountable first and foremost for leading the people right or wrong. And their penalty is greater. We have seen this throughout the Torah. If they disobey God, they get it first. A scary place to be. Okay, we see that this covenant has been broken. The covenant has been broken. Now, we can all the time talk about our new covenant, Messiah. Well, we're going to see that there's going to be a new covenant. Even here, after this first covenant has been broken. Let's start chapter 33 and verse 1. Then Yodi Vafe, the Lord spoke to Moshe, Depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up from the land of Egypt, to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your descendants I will give it. And I will send an angel before you. He's going to send an angel before him. Before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the, Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey. And for I will not go up in your midst. He's saying, now I'm not going to go up in your midst now. Because you are an obstinate people, lest I destroy you on the way. You have broken this covenant with me, and now I'm not going to go up with you in the midst. You're going up there by yourself because if I go with you, I'm going to have to destroy you. <coughs> when the people heard this sad word, they went into mourning, and none of them put on his ornaments. They won't ready anymore to put on their ornaments and to have a joyous occasion. They were very sad. For Yodei Vafhe, the Lord had said to Moshe, Say to the sons of Israel, You are an obstinate people. Should I go up in the midst for one moment, I would destroy you. Now therefore put off your ornaments from you, that I may know what I will do with you. He's saying, take them all off. You want to take them off and build a golden calf out of it? Take all your ornaments off. I'm going to figure out what I'm going to do, do about this situation. Now, I know this sounds hard. This sounds 
kind of kind of raffle, but let's let's just hang in here because we're gonna see some interesting things take place here in a minute. So the sons of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb onward. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, a good distance from the camp, and he called it the tent of Midian or the Mishkan, the tabernacle. And it came about that everyone who sought Yodavahe would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. And it came about whenever Moses went out to the tent that all the people would arise and stand, each at the entrance of his tent, and gaze after Moshe until he entered the tent. And it came about whenever Moshe entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and, sta and stand at the entrance of the tent, and Yodavahe the Lord would speak with Moshe. When all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would arise and worship, each at the entrance of the tent. Thus so showed Abafe the Lord used to speak to Moshe face to face. This is interesting terminology. We're going to talk about that a little bit later on. Because we've said, and we've always been taught from the scripture, that no man has seen him face to face and lived. But there's a, there's a reason for what's being said here. Just as a man speaks to his friend, when Moshe returned to the camp, his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man would not depart from the tent. Then Moshe said to yodeh the Lord, See thou dost say to me, Bring up this people, but thou thyself hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Moreover, thou hast said, I have known you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found favor in thy sight, let me know thy ways, that I may know thee, so that I may find favor in thy sight. Consider too that this nation is thy people. He's interceding. Now I'm gonna, you can count this as we go through if you want to, but I'm going to say this to you. The covenant has been broken. What's the reality of it? A death sentence on the people of Israel, is it not? We're going to see in here, though, that Moses will intercede three times for the people in this case where the covenant was broken. Has anybody seen the picture yet? I've been teaching and talking about this for a long time. Anytime we see the number three in Hebraic understanding, it's a picture of resurrection and life from impending death or from death. It's always a picture of Messiah who is the resurrection and the life. So he's going to literally intercede three times for them so that they will be delivered from this impending death sentence. So let's, let's go through this. I want to put this out there for your thought while we're reading it. He said, verse 14, and he said, My presence shall go with you, and I will give you rest. Then he said to him, If thy presence does not go with us, do not lead us up from here. For how then can it be known that I have found favor in thy sight, I and thy people? Is it not thy going with us that we, I, and thy people may be distinguished from all other peoples who are upon the face of the earth. I'm telling you, Moses was awesome. He had an awesome relationship with the Father and just an awesome intercessor for the people. And Yodipafe, the Lord said to Moshe, I will do this thing of which you have spoken, for you have found favor in my sight, and I have known you by name. He knew Moshe by name. Then Moshe said, I pray thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I myself will make my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of Yodavah, hey, the Lord, before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. I thought it just said that he saw him face to face. Now he says, no man can see his face and live. We, we, well, let's, let's move on and we'll see this in just a moment, okay? Then Yodavathe said, Behold, there is a place by me. Let's pay really close attention to what I'm fixing to share with you, and you really probably want to take some notes. Okay, because it said, Then Yodavathe said, Behold, there is a place by me. He's saying there's a place by me, Moses, and you shall stand there on the rock. Now let me tell you that place and that rock and that right hand is Yeshua that's beside him on the right hand of the Father. Amen. Okay? And it will come about while my glory is passing by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. 
Do you understand how we can talk to God? We can talk to God by being in that cleft of the rock. Yeshua the Messiah is our cover when we're in Him. And He is that right hand of protection for us. And how that we can come before Him through that right hand. This is how we can talk face to face, so to speak, with God, is through the person of Yeshua. But we cannot see literally the Father face to face. It's through Yeshua is how we see the Father. Otherwise, if we saw, could literally see the, the, the glory, the presence of Him would literally kill us. It would be so overwhelming because an unholy people, even though He makes us holy through Spirit, cannot stand in the presence of a perfect God. So He says, let's look at this again because this is a really powerful verse here. Most people miss this. And it will come about while my glory is passing by. While I'm passing, I will put you in the cleft of the rock. I will put you in Yeshua. Yeshua will be your covering. He will be the right hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away and you shall see my back. But my face shall not be seen. So he was allowed when he passed by in, in, in the fullness, the fullness of his presence, that he could only see just a portion of it when he allowed him to step beside Yeshua and see it, or he would not be able to live. That's a powerful verse. Think about that. He's our covering. Now, Yodei Vafe said to Moshe, cut out for yourself two stone tablets like the former ones, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the former tablets which you shattered. Okay? So be ready by morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain and no man is to come up with you nor let any man be seen anywhere on the mountain even the flocks and the herds may not graze in front of the mountain so he cut out two stone tablets like the former ones and Moshe rose up early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai as Yodhi Vapha the Lord had commanded him and he took two stone tablets in his hand and Yodhi Vapha the Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of Yodei He called upon the name of Yodei the Lord, and he descended in the cloud. Folks, this cloud is overwhelming too, because there's always that cloud when he shows up. Yeshua went to the Mount of Olives after his time on earth was up, and he told the disciples to tarry in Jerusalem, and it said a cloud came and received him out of their sight. And the angels, as, as, as they gazed, as the apostles gazed at him, as people gazed at him leaving, said, why do you stand here gazing? This same Yeshua that's leaving, he'll come again in like manner. He's coming back on the clouds of heaven. With, you know, the scripture's clear about this. It's the glory, I call it the glory cloud, the Shekinah, the power of God. Then Yodei Vafhe passed by in front of him and proclaimed, Yodei Vafhe, Yodhi Vafe, Elohim, compassion and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. Now I want to stop here a minute because I want to back up before I read the rest of this and I want to show you there's a change that's taking place from the giving of the first covenant and the giving of the second covenant. I'll call it the renewed covenant, the new covenant to the house of Israel that had broken the first covenant. All right, so let's go over here real quickly. It's only a couple of verses back to Exodus 20. Let's go back to Exodus 20 real quick. <clears throat> Exodus 20, 5 through 7. Remember, he's speaking the 10 words and he's given this to the, pe to the people of Israel from Mount Sinai. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is heaven, of what is in heaven above or on the earth or beneath or in the waters under it. You shall not worship them nor serve them, for I, Yodhi Vapha, your Elohim, am jealous. Number one, he's telling the people that he's jealous. He's not going to have any other gods before him. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and fourth generations for those who hate me, so what's this? This is really sort of a negative proclamation, isn't it? That if you don't do it the way I told you to do it, I'm going to visit the, your iniquity on you and on your children even to the third and fourth generation. That's not kind of what we really want to hear, right? And it says, but showing loving kindness to thousands, 
to those who love me and keep my commandments. Now this is a positive aspect. If you love him and you keep his commandments, then then, then he's going to show uh, uh, love and kindness. But verse 7, And you shall not take the name of Yodhi Vafi, your Elohim, in vain, for Yodhi Vafi will not leave him unpunished, who takes his name in vain. So number one, he's jealous. Number two, he's going to punish those who sin and hate him. And number three, he's going to show kindness only to those who love him. That's so far a positive thing. And he will not forgive those who take his name in vain. There's only one positive in all that. Okay? So we see really when they sinned and they broke the covenant, they were truly under a death sentence. Now, let's get back to where we just stopped reading that. Because what's happening right now is Moshe has gone back up. He's interceded for them. They had a death sentence. God's heard him. He's heard his intercession. He's going to forgive them and let it go. And he's going to let Moses bring the tablets back up and he's going to restore the covenant, a renewed, a new covenant. For the people of Israel. And this is what he says. I'm going to start back at verse 5 again of 34. And Yodhivafe descended in the cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of Yodhivafe. Then Yodhivafe passed by in front of him and proclaimed, Yodhivafe, Yodhivafe Elohim, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth. Does that not sound different this time than it did the first time? who keeps loving kindness for thousands, and for who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. But yet there's all this positive in there with it. And Moshe made haste to bow low toward the earth and worship. And he said, If now I have found favor in thy sight, O Lord, I pray, let Adonai, the Lord, go along in our midst. Because he's already said he's not going in our midst. He's, and now Moses is interceding. That if, you really, if we really found favor, would you come on and go along in, in our midst with us? Even though the people are obstinate, even though we're obstinate, and do thou pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us as thy own possession. Now, this time, he's merciful. This time, he's gracious. This time he's long suffering. This time he's saying, I'm abundant in goodness and truth. This time I, I, I give mercy to thousands. I forgive iniquity, transgression, and sin. He will punish, but not necessarily right away. Sin may be visited upon the descendants of the one who sins. So we see the other aspects of, uh, of him in this situation because the people obviously are going to sin. Moses, the great intercessor, is involved in this. Yeshua, our great intercessor, he's died for our sins to redeem us. In the Brit Hadashah, of the New Covenant, was declared by Jeremiah in Jeremiah 31 and 31 that the day would come when Messiah would come to earth and be the fulfillment of all these things. And again, would in fact have to enact a new covenant, but this time made only even better promises, not the blood of bulls and goats, but his own blood once and for all. So we see a different aspect in this. It says then in verse 10, In Elohim God said, Behold, I am going to make a covenant before all your people. I will perform miracles which have not been produced in all the earth, nor among any of the nations. And all the people among whom you live will see the working of Yodhi Vavhe, the Lord who is a fearful, for it is a fearful thing that I am going to perform with you. Be sure to observe what I am commanding you this day. Behold, I am going to drive out the Amorite before you, and the Canaanite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hevite, and the Jebusite. Watch yourself that you make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land into which you are going. Test it, lest it become a snare in your midst. Now, God's warning Israel, when you go in this land, when I lead you into the land, don't you make any covenant with those people. Those people are to be put out of the land. And we see today with our nation Israel, with Israel back as a nation for the first time in the land, that America and others are pushing them to make covenants with all these different people who are against them. And we see that it's not working out. It's never going to work out. One of these days they're going to have to realize that, we, we, you know what? We're going to have to do it God's way all the way, the way the Bible told us to do it, in order for this thing to finally be worked out. So we're to be careful. As sons and daughters of the Most High, we may not be in the land of our promise yet, 
But we have to be careful that we don't assimilate or make covenants with people that we're surrounded with that will lead us away from the true living God to obey His commandments. We have to be careful that we train our young people when they're children to understand that you're going to marry within the household of God's faith. You're not going to marry outside the household of faith because if you don't do that, if you don't instill that in them when they're young and they get older, then they're going to rebel and go marry somebody that may not even be a believer in any way. And we see this happening all the time. We've got to be careful not to make covenants with people outside of our faith. Watch, your, watch yourself that you make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land into which you're going, lest it become a snare in your midst. Some of you have already experienced this. Y'all know what I'm talking about. But God's able to deliver us and deliver our children. But rather you are to tear down their altars and smash their sacred pillars and cut down their asherim. <coughs> and asherim was a symbol of female deity like Esther, Easter, and all those. Now, again, we can't go do that. This is, this is God's people and the land they're promised, and they're coming to that land as a nation, and they're going to cut, tear all that stuff down. We can't do that here in America because we'll get put in jail. You understand what I'm saying? Don't go out there if you see somebody's idol in their yard and <laughs> smash it. If they catch you, you're going to jail, okay? The man's going to show up in the car with the handcuffs. Don't call me to come get you out if you did what I told you not to do. <laughs> All right? Somebody wonders why you say it. Because I've had to do things for people I told them not to do before, and they did it anyway, and then suffered consequences for it. Please don't do that. Don't make my job hard. I love you too much for that. So, the bottom line is this. So here's what we can do in this land. We can tear down those idols, those golden calves that's been in our life. If we'll get them out of our life, if we'll tear them down out of our life and we'll worship Him in spirit and in truth, people's going to see the light of God in us. And that will cause them to ask questions and give us a chance to share the good news of the gospel. And some of those people are going to come to faith. Some of them are not. And we can see people's hearts and lives change. That's how we can tear down all these aisles to the Spirit of God operating through us. You understand what I'm saying? God's going to deal with all this exterior stuff when He returns. He's done said He's going to do the judgment on the whole earth. He's going to destroy all, all idolatry, all false worship when He returns. And His name is going to be the only name. Amen. For you shall not worship any other God. For Yodavate, the Lord whose name is jealous, is a jealous Elohim, a jealous God. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and play the harlot with their gods and sacrifice to their gods and someone invites you to eat of his sacrifice. Now I want to say this to everybody, but especially to the young people. Young people, I know a lot of you are going to the secular school. I wish that wasn't the case. If the Father tarries long enough and these pe and the people of all miserable band together and, and, and we get enough of people, hopefully we can have our own school eventually, but I don't know. That's in God's time. I don't have, but let me say this to you. You're going to be tested, young people, and tried on every hand to join in with people who are unbelievers. They're into all kinds of false worship, all kinds of idolatry, Ouija boards, and every satanic thing you can think of and tell you, well, you just need to decide to go your own way and do your own thing. I'm going to tell you, it's going to lead you down a path of destruction and a path of no return if you're not careful. You need to listen to your godly parents. Some of you have had parents that have failed in the past and they've asked God to forgive them, and, they, and He has, and He's changing their lives, and they're, and they're doing their best to reconcile and love you and train you and teach you to go the right way so you don't have to make the mistakes they made. You listen to your parents and obey those parents that you have that are doing that for you, okay? Amen. It'll save you a lot of heartbreak and a lot of heartache. Yeah, well, yeah, but I'll be the only one there. It's okay. You'd be a set-apart people. I remember many times being the only one that didn't participate in some of the stuff that was going on at school. I remember being the only one that didn't participate when I was in boot camp with some of the things. You know, I, I, it's tough. But listen, God's greater. He'll see you through it. Verse 16, and you take some of his daughters for your sons. Let me back up a minute. Verse 15, I'm going to read it again. 
lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land and they play the harlot with their gods and sacrifice to their gods and someone invites you to eat of his sacrifice and you take some of his daughters for your sons and his daughters play the harlot with their gods and cause your sons also to play the harlot with their gods. See that? A simulation. Satan wants you young people and us older people to assimilate into the world system. And even into the world system of false worship, of false religion, he is constantly trying to get us, oh, well, you know, let's just love everybody. We can love everybody by what? Obeying God's commandments. That's his way of love. <laughs> Accepting and loving a homosexual, a liar, a thief, or any an adulterer or any of those things, accepting their lifestyle into our body is not what God's saying. Loving them is praying for them, speaking God's word, His commandments to them, and telling them they can do Teshuvah and repent, and God will change their life and renew their life and save them from the destruction they're headed in. That, and then we bring them in, you see, because we're a hospital here for sinners too, but we're not a hospital here to accept abominations and let them live in that sin here and be a part of this body. And that's what the world and religion is trying to get us to do today. Right. Did you know that? That's what they're trying. We cannot go there. Amen. We can love those people without going there. Amen. We can be a witness to them, and when they want to get on board, we're here for them. Yeah. And we'll pray for them and do all we can in the meantime for them. And, and let me say this. You respect all people, irregardless of how bad they are. You try your best to show respect to all people, or you're not going to win them. You don't go along with it, but you can show respect. You shall make for yourself no molten gods. You shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For seven days you are to eat unleavened bread, as I commanded you at the appointed time. The Hebrew word there is moedim. A specific time, an appointed time, unleavened bread, which all this takes place is coming up soon. Passover, Pesach, unleavened bread. It's an appointed time for the body of Messiah for us to do as a memorial of what Messiah has already done for us in the month of Abib. For in the month of Abib, you came out of Egypt. You came out of Egypt. Egypt was a picture in type, Mitzrayim or Egypt, a bondage of slavery. Through Messiah, we came out through his atoning blood and sacrifice as the Passover lamb, as the true and leavened bread from heaven, as the first fruits to rise from the dead, and the giving of his spirit. He is the one who has redeemed us. And he says, from now we're going to do this as a memorial unto him till he comes back for us the second time as the bride. Because right now, he is our intercessor, our high priest, our soon coming king. And he is our bridegroom preparing our room in the house as the bride Messiah. Amen. So that when the father says it's time, one of these falls, he's coming back for us. Amen. The first offspring from every womb belongs to me. And all your male livestock, the first offspring from cattle and sheep. And you shall redeem with a lamb the first offspring from a donkey. And if you do not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. You shall redeem all the firstborn of your sons. And none shall appear before me empty-handed. You shall work six days, but on the seventh day you shall rest. Even during, even during plowing time and harvest you shall rest. Why is this so important? Why is put this in there? Because farmers have a tendency, well... You know, the stuff's ready, the crops are ready, and it's time to harvest it. And I know it's Shabbat, but I need to get this harvest in. No, God says, you trust me, it'll work out. Yes. God says, you keep my Shabbat. Yes. Monday, you can go back to work. Yeah. Huh? Or, or I said Monday, you're actually Sunday's <laughs> the first day of the week. You can go back to work, okay? Amen. Six days. So what's he doing? He is reiterating this renewed new covenant, everything that was in the first. And verse 22 says, and you shall celebrate the Feast of Weeks, or Shavuot, what we call Pentecost. That is the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the Feast of Ingathering at the turn of the year, the Feast of Ingathering, Yom Teruah, uh, uh, Yom, Yom Kippur, uh, Sukkot, what's what talking about the fall. Three times a year your males are to appear before Yod Vav the Elohim of Israel. Now, we can't do that in Jerusalem, we're not in Israel, and, we, and there's no temple standing, but we can do that as rehearsals where we're at in the world today, realizing he's coming back for us soon. For I will drive out nations before you and enlarge your borders, and no man shall covet your land when you go up three times a year to appear before Yodi Vapa, your Elohim. The truth of the matter is, if they had done what God said to start off with and obeyed him and everything, they, they would have stayed in the land. 
The other truth of the matter is if they hadn't broken the covenant, the first covenant, at this, at this time that we're reading in, uh, and, and had to go in calf incident, do you know that it went straight to the land? They wouldn't have been wandering out in the wilderness for 40 years. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with unleavened with leaven bread, excuse me, nor is the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover to be left over until morning. You shall bring the very first of the first fruits of your soul into the house of Yodi Vafa, your old king. You shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. Uh, that's one of the things, so if you've been coming regularly, you know what it is, but that's where uh, some, some of the folks in rabbinical Judaism get the thing that you can't have dairy and, and meat together, but that's not what it's talking about. It's simply talking about you don't boil a kid, a newborn calf, in its mother's milk. It was a Canaanite practice, and it was unkind. Then Yodhi Vafe said to Moshe, write down these words, for in accordance with uh, these words I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. See there, write them down, I've made this covenant. He's given a new covenant. So he was there with Yodhi Vafe, the Lord, 40 days and 40 nights. He did not eat bread or drink water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. And I'm going to tell you something. He was in the presence. He was in the glory cloud for 40 days and 40 nights. There is no way that you can survive with no natural food or water, especially water for 40 days, unless you are really in the presence of the unleavened bread, the Word of God, and the mankind, the living water of Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah. That's why he could do what he did. If you try to do this without that, you're not going to live but so long. And it came about when Moshe was coming down from Mount Sinai and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moshe's hands as he was coming down from, out, from the mountain that Moshe did not know that the skin of his face shone because of his speaking with him. He was in the presence of God. It was so powerful that his face was shining. So Moshe... Or excuse me, when Aaron and all the sons of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. Then Moshe called them, and Aaron and all the rulers in the congregation returned to him, and Moshe spoke to them. And afterwards, all the sons of Israel came near, and he commanded them to do everything that Yodavafe the Lord had spoken to him on Mount Sinai. When Moshe had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever Moshe went, and before Yodhi Vafe to speak with him, he would take off the veil until he came out. And whenever he came out and spoke to the sons of Israel, what he had been commanded, the sons of Israel would see the face of Moshe that shone, that the skin of, that the skin of Moses' face shone. So Moshe would replace the veil over his face until he went in to speak with him. Can you imagine that? Oh, man, the presence of God <coughs> shining from him. Now this is the end of this part of the day. But next week, next week, when we start the new Parsha, next week, guess what it starts off with? Guess what it starts off with? The Sabbath being re-emphasized in this new covenant. Isn't that... Do you think God wants us to keep His Sabbath and His Sabbaths? Amen. Too many of us, too much of religion in Christendom has belittled this as though somehow God did away with it. We have clearly seen from the Torah and the prophets and the Brit Hashah, the New Covenant, that He has never done away with it. It is a signet ring for those of the body of Messiah. Hallelujah. Now, the, the uh, half Torah portion, let's, let's, let's turn to 1 Kings real quick. We're almost done. I'm just going to read a couple of verses and read the rest of it. This, this is First uh, Kings 18 verses 1 through 19. I'm, going to read, I'm just going to read a little bit in the front and I'm going to read the end of it for the sake of time. Verse 18, chapter 18, verse 1, 1 Kings. Now it came about after many days that the word of Yodavafe came to Eliyahu or Elijah in the third year. Listen to me. Number three again. Did y'all see that? Number three. 
saying, Go show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the face of the earth. When is this taking place? There had been a drought in Israel because of Israel's sin, because the heavens had been shut up, because the command was given to Elijah. And now it's the third year. And he's saying, go ahead now and show yourself to the king Ahab, a wicked king, and his wicked queen or wife Jezebel, who had slain the prophets of God and had set up her own prophets. That's what religion does today. They'll set up their, they, they, won't, they won't quit having religion. They won't quit. They'll just set their own form of it because they don't want to hear the direct directive of the commandments of God because God tells us what is sin, what is clean, and what is not clean. And he wants us to follow his way. And when people don't want to follow his way and want to do their own thing, they'll just try to kill God's prophets and set their own prophets up, their own form of religious worship, and do their own thing. And this is what was happening in the northern tribes of Israel in that day in the northern kingdom. And Elijah was a prophet there. But we now see that Israel was in a bad drought if you read the rest of the story. Animals were dying. The food was short. There was a death looming over the land of Israel because of no rain. What happens when you don't have water? Long enough, things die. Yeah. Things dry up and die. But what's Elijah fixing to do through all this showing his test upon Israel? He's going to show up on the third year, the third day, so to speak. And he's going to speak the word because God's told him to. The rain's going to begin to fall, and there's going to be life restored where there was impending death, Amen. resurrection life. Do you see the picture? Okay, let's just skip on over here. You can read the rest of it yourself. Verse 17. And it came about when Ahab saw Elijah, and Ahab said to him, is this you troubler of is this you you troubler of Israel? People's gonna to say to you today if you obey God's word, if you live according to his word and you look different. What's y'all's problem? What's your problem, Brother Andy? Why can't you just go along with everybody? Are you trying to turn the world upside down? I hope so. I hope you're obeying God and it turns the world upside down. What's our problem? Why are we why do you can't you just go along with the crowd? No. God said not to. God said, the only way you're going to be saved is if I don't go along with the crowd and set the example he's got for your life. I'm here that your life can be preserved and you don't even know it yet. You troubler of Israel, is that you? Some of y'all are troublers of this nation because you're standing on the word of God today and this nation's not going the right way. And he said, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have because you have forsaken the midst of the commandments of Yodavah, hey the Lord, and you have followed the Baals. He's speaking to the king of the northern tribe of Israel. You understand? It's supposed to be God's covenant people who have decided to go over here and follow Ishtar, Easter, and all these other pagan uh, religious beliefs and have, have left behind the Sabbaths of God, the commandments of God, and replaced them with their own commandments, the traditions of men. That's what he's saying to King Ahab. He says, you're the one that's the problem, not me. You're the one that's forsaken the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and set up your own false prophets and your own false gods in front of the people of Israel and caused them to sin as well. Do you know that when leadership, religious leadership, preachers or rabbis or anything else does that and they forsake the commandments of God, they are causing the rest of the people to sin and lead them into idolatry. Now, verse 19, Now then send and gather to me all Israel on Mount Carmel, together with 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of the Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. Now I'm going to read two more verses, and that's going to be it. So Ahab sent a message among all the sons of Israel and brought the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah, Eliyahu, came near to all the people and said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions. I hope and pray that there's not some folks here that still hesitate between two opinions. You're going to have to choose one or the other, ladies and gentlemen, sooner or later. It's just a matter of time. If Yodevah, the Lord is Elohim, if he is God, follow him. If Baal, Baal, the false gods of the Asherah, all the false teachings out here, all these false gods, then follow him if that's what you believe. But the people did not answer him a word. And you can read the rest of the story and what took place. Let's turn over to 1 Corinthians real quick and we'll end up with this. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 
We're going to decide. We're going to follow God, do it His way, or we're going to keep being religious and do it religion's way. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Verse 4. We're going to start. <clears throat> Shiloh is talking to, Corinth, to the Corinthians at Corinth. Therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world and that there is no God but one. When we clearly understand God's where we know that all the stuff that they claim to be God's and idols is a bunch of junk, it's foolishness. When we have that kind of knowledge, we know it don't mean nothing to us. It ain't God's, it ain't nothing anyway. It's man's set up. Those, that's for those who have come to that knowledge of the truth yet because some haven't yet. And we know there's not but one God. Yod Vafe. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords. So he's not, he's not counteracting what he just said. He's saying, we know they're really not, but we know that as far as the world's concerned and the people are concerned, that there are many lords and many gods to them. Mm -hmm. Yet for us there is but one Elohim, one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for Him, and one Lord and Master, Yeshua the Messiah, by whom are all things, and we exist through Him. However, not all men have this knowledge, but some being accustomed to the idol unto now, eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. When we go in and we get involved with all these things, uh, and have our eating and our stuff together with all this stuff, that's what happens. But food will not be, but food will not commend us to God. We are neither the worse if we do not eat, nor the better if we do eat. But take care lest this liberty of yours somehow become a stumbling block to the weak, to the ones who don't understand this yet. For if someone sees you who have knowledge dining in an idol's temple, Will not his conscience, if he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? In other words, if you're eating somewhere and someplace and, and uh, someone sees you in there and they think you shouldn't be there eating because that's really kind of like a, they feel like there's a, that's a place uh, uh, that you sh that's an uh, idolatrous place. I don't know. Let's come up with an example. Say you're in a Chinese restaurant and they got Buddha in there or something. You know, and they see you and they don't understand it. To you, that's nothing. And you're just eating Chinese food there. You might cause them to fail. You might cause them to become weak in that, thinking you shouldn't be there, and it, it's okay. And they go in there, and they literally work, and they go in there to eat, but they go in there to eat and worship Buddha. It's like you're putting your signature on it. It's okay, and it's not. That's the best example I can give you for modern day. Maybe someone's got a better one. For the, for through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined. The brother of whose sake Messiah died, and thus by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Messiah. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again, that I might not cause my brother to stumble. This has nothing to do with whether or not you're eating pork or not. Okay? It has to do with idolatry. Let's make that clear in this understanding. Because it's been so twisted around. These rhymes are so twisted around. So that's all it's about. And we saw this over in the Torah portion today. That's why we read it from Corinthians. It has to do with sacrifices to idols, of which to us who have knowledge understand that's foolishness to begin with. There's only one God.